Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, uh, as we had discussed, ritual, the kind of role it plays and how it is used as a mode of uh, communications, not just in terms of the one who actually the, does the, perform the ritual, but also other components which are involved in the whole process of this ritual. And, uh, we also had discussed that the rituals normally are not just uh, mere word utterances, but it actually is something which is encoded with different kind of meanings. So, in order to see or make understand uh, this particular ritual process, one also need to see uh, or contextualize in time and space. And uh, the effectiveness is rather being felt uh, in terms of the kind of symbols or signal, signal which is enhanced and also how it is being, the meaning is being enacted. Now, uh, enactment of this meaning in a way uh, can be uh, seen in the context of the physical and the meaningful and also when we talk about the physical and the meaningful, it involves the kind of uh, accent, uh, how an individual tries to uh, not just perform the ritual, but also how he as an individual makes sense of it. The kind of expectations which normally involve in this ritual uh, is important in this context. And secondly, uh, it is also important to see uh, the kind of acceptance and belief and uh, conformity uh, within a particular society or a community. Now, what is this acceptance then? Which means uh, the idea or the kind of uh, action which is being performed by the uh, ritual performer and needs to be accepted by the other members of the society and also uh, it needs to have uh, some kind of uh, uh, a belief from other members that uh, so and so ritual in a way will have certain kind of an outcome or it, ha it, it will definitely be ha have an effective and also uh, uh, conformity by other members. Uh, as, as, as we had differentiated between theater and ritual, uh, wherein in a theater uh, normally it is the performer and uh, the audience, but in the case of ritual, uh, whoever is present there becomes a participant. So, therefore, it is important for other members who are part or being present there to conform to the kind of rules and also values uh, which are already being uh, you know carried on for generations. Now, that is how meanings are being encoded and also being uh, followed by other members of the society. Therefore, this enactment of meaning in this enactment of meaning it is important for once to look at uh, uh, to have this acceptance belief and conformity. Now, uh, moving on, uh, I, I would like to discuss how uh, ritual uh, regulations actually happened in environmental relations uh, and uh, which I will of course, be discussing in the light of the 
Sembaga community in New Guinea. Now, how ritual in a way regulate and the kind of processes which involve, and if at all, how rituals become effective, not just in terms of uh, their immediate uh, neighbors or environment, but also in a, in a far more less uh, environmental relations with other members of the group. Now, if we look at as we had uh, discussed the meaning of what religion is by Emil Durkheim. Now, we happen to see that uh, uh, normally the functionalist tends to see uh, this religious behavior uh, to be sort of uh, engaged in uh, having a specific goal or which we can say as an analytical goal. And uh, what is this goal then? It is nothing but the uh, elucidations of events, processes, and also a relationship uh, which occur within a social unit. Now, uh, when we talk about this uh, relationship which occur within a social unit, we need to make sure or uh, we need to be very clear about what social unit is. Now, Durkheim in a way uh, was also uh, a functionalist and he tends to see religion as playing a role of a unifying factor or, or, bring, or ensuring and bringing certain some kind of solidarity in the community. Now, similarly, even in the discipline of uh, anthropology, this religious behavior in a way has an analytical goal and uh, which often is being displayed in the context of events processes or a relationship which occurs within the social unit. And, uh, and a social unit is nothing but uh, again it is uh, often a group of people who entertain the uh, same kind of beliefs uh, about uh, the universe or in other words we can say who have a more or less a similar cosmology or a group of people or a congregation uh, who in a way participate together in the performance of these religious rituals. Now, uh, who in a way have similar beliefs and practices and uh, who in some sense uh, have this conform uh, or accept uh, this religious behavior is uh, a social unit. Now, uh, in order to uh, <coughs> further elaborate uh, what is the functions of these religious rituals, uh, I, I quote from Homans uh, in, in, in which he says that uh, the functions of rituals can be contextualized in the context that Ritual actions uh, do not uh, produce a practical result on the external world. Now, usually we anticipate that ritual will have certain kind of uh, impact and which, which can be pretty much uh, apparent and evident. But uh, as Homan says, uh, ritual does not produce a practical result to the external world, which means it does not have an immediate if not uh, a direct consequences uh, or a practical result. Uh, and that is one of the reason why we call them ritual and uh, but to make the statement uh, in, a, in a sense is not to say that uh, ritual does not have any functions. Its function rather is not related to the world external to the society. But rather, it is embedded or which is an internal to the constitution of the society. So, in a sense, uh, ritual is pretty much uh, uh, internal in character and uh, which is only operationalized or effective only to members of uh, the society who are part of it. 
and also through this ritual it gives the members of the society a uh, certain kind of uh, confidence and if it dispels their anxieties and also it disciplines their social organizations. Now, by participating in a ritual, uh, uh, normally it, it, it to some extent has uh, not just guided by the individuals, but also uh, it, it, it enhances uh, not just the confidence, but also in, in, in a way it brings certain kinds of hopes to the members of the uh, community. And also, uh, when, when they are in their adversity uh, or, or their grievances, it, it sometimes tends to uh, wipe off their grievances and anxieties and also uh, by following certain kinds of norms and values, it disciplines uh, their social organizations. So, in a sense, uh, uh, what Homans in a way uh, define is, ritual has served a lot of purpose to the internal uh, structure of the social organization rather than the, the external. Now, therefore, uh, we, we cannot really say that ritual is not uh, having any kind of consequences or impacts, but rather uh, <coughs> internally it, it seems to provide a certain kind of far reaching impact. Now, if we look closely at the kind of uh, ritual cycle uh, among the Sembaga community in New Guinea, now what are the kind of roles this ritual act actually plays and to what extent this ritual is being effective and uh, how do the members in a way uh, conform or discipline themselves uh, or, or what are the kind of plants and animals uh, which they in a way think, uh, perceive to be you know uh, uh, sacred. Now, ritual in a way uh, plays an important part in uh, sort of regulating the relationship of these uh, the in the within the Sembega community uh, and uh, with both the non-human components of their immediate environment and also the human component at their less immediate environment that is uh, other group members like the marine uh, speaking groups. And because the reason why it is important to look at the other uh, <coughs> similar groups is because they, they, they seem to have uh, maintained uh, you know uh, not always peaceful, but also at times there is a war going on between different communities. So, to what extent and what are the kind of uh, relationship uh, the Sembega community in a way share with their neighboring uh, groups? And, 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 and what, how is ritual in a way uh, uh, determinant in uh, <coughs> sort of sharing their relationship with other external members of the group? So, it will be important to locate and contextualize uh, the Sembega's ritual cycle in this sense. Now, this ritual regulation also in a way help to maintain uh, not just uh, between the non-human and the human, but also the biotic communities uh, existing within the territories that is the read which, which, which also in a sense redistribute land among people and people over land and limits the frequencies of fighting. Now, uh, normally people go or wait war when they are in a way you know prepare enough or perform some certain kind of ritual. Now, again that is how the environment in a way is being kept uh, balanced in, in, in some sense. Now, we had also partly uh, discussed about uh, 
A rapoport speaks for the ancestors in some time uh, when we were talking about uh, the concepts and meanings of human ecology, the kind of uh, models which are involved, the individual, the cognized system models, so and so forth. I, I won't be repeating that, but I'll just only partially try to recall some of those as we are <coughs> talking in uh, the context of this. How uh, religion is playing an important or ritual is an important role in this ecology. Now, religious ritual also. Uh, in a, in a sense can be uh, defined as uh, a prescribed performance of conventionalized acts that is uh, pre prescribed or pre decided uh, rules which are being normally followed in a uh, sort of conventionalized manner and which is manifested uh, directly towards the involvement uh, of the non empirical or the supernatural agencies in the uh, affairs of the actors. So, in a way uh, human tends to you know shape their imaginings or understanding uh, of their uh, rituals or performances in relation to the non human uh, or the supernatural agencies how they maintain certain kind of uh, relations and what are the kind of expectations which are uh, hovering around in that community. Now, uh, at this point it is important to point out uh, what are the kind of uh, the ideas which surround uh, the Sembaga ecosystem. What then is an ecosystem? Uh, our understanding so far goes that an ecosystem is uh, the kind of relationship which shares among the species in a particular uh, geographical niche or an ecological niche. And uh, looking at the Sambegas ecosystem, it is also important to point out the kind of occupations which they are engaged into and uh, what are the food crops they have been. Uh, pretty much dependent on. Now, an ecosystem in the context of the Sembega also uh, consists of the material uh, exchange and also uh, how they maintain this against other human groups, which in a sense is being pretty much exclusive, exclusively access uh, to these resources uh, within their territorial borders. Now, sometime uh, it is also interesting to see that how a particular plant uh, is given so much importance uh, and uh, how does it convey a meaning to other members of the group uh, in terms of uh, certain kinds of difficulties or uh, any, any kind of eventualities arises. Now, conversely it is also uh, from this territory alone that uh, the Sambegas were able to generate uh, the subsistence uh, means of this livelihood for them and uh, some of the normally uh, agriculture practices which they follow is the they follow the horticulturalist that is more or less engaged in gardening. Now, some of the staple roots also which includes a range of uh, root crops, uh, taro and then uh, the sweet potatoes being the most important and yams and manic less so. Now, all the gardens are in a way mixed and uh, many of them are containing certain kind of uh, major root crops, main, ma many greens namely the taro yam gardens and also the sugar sweet potato gardens. Now, uh, these are partly the sort of the economic background of the Simbaga communities and uh, what are the kind of uh, staple diets they normally engage into. Apart from this, they also engage in uh, herding of animals like pigs and uh, which in a way is uh, sort of a source of nutrition and diet 
uh, for them or maybe we can say it is a source of protein for them. Now, as a rule uh, these populations are again being uh, <coughs> sort of uh, redistributed and uh, stated in terms of the ritual cycles. Now, a man becomes a, a member of a territorial group by participating within the within with it in the planting of a room bin. Now, what is this room bin? Why is the planting of a room bin so much given importance here? Now, uh, the importance of this room bin planting ritual again in a sense uh, represents uh, or even constitute the fundamental terms of the marine cosmology and uh, society at the same time that it establishes a sanctified truce. Now, a truce is being signed uh, between uh, the human and non-human and uh, when a room bin is being planted, it in a sense give uh, an assurance or uh, it testify that uh, in that room bin it contains the spirits or soul of their ancestor. Now, in a way uh, as long as that room bin stays in the soil, it in a way have sort of uh, uh, a mutual understanding between the Sembega and the non-human or the supernatural forces. Now, therefore, it, it in a sense have that kind of uh, understanding if not uh, a cordial relationship between them and uh, through these practices it also maintain uh, uh, sort of a healthy or uh, uh, an adaptive mechanism between uh, the non-human and the human and rumbin is thus associated with the uh, patrilineity as well as the uh, territoriality and with man's well-being and strength. Now, they in a way assume that they are dependent on the territory at the same time as long as uh, the room wind is attached to the soil or the ground, uh, they sort of evoke certain kind of uh, a trust which is considered to be sanctified among the Sembega community. Now, if you look at the operation, the operational ritual uh, which is uh, present among the Sembega and other marines that is the adjoining groups of people in a sense helps to maintain an undegraded environment. Uh, undegraded environment how? Because what are the kind of checks and balances which they normally engage into? Because they limit fighting to frequencies which do not uh, endanger the existence of this regional uh, population and also they adjust this man land ratios which in a way facilitates trade distributes local surpluses of pig throughout the regional population in the form of pork and assures people of high quality protein when they are most in need of it. Now, therefore, this operational ritual uh, which is evident among the Sembega and uh, the Maring in a sense uh, evokes certain kind of uh, uh, how a balance is maintained in the environment, uh, the kind of animals which are being slaughtered and uh, again which I said I had uh, uh, talked at quite discussed at length about the pig slaughters which was practiced among the Sembegas in the, the preceding lectures. Now, Rappaport in a way uh, postulates that uh, the Sembega ritual uh, slaughter and this consumption of these pigs that is which is locally known as the Kaiko function as a, a regulatory mechanisms that keeps within the, the acceptable uh, parameters in the size of the hearts of pigs. For example, the intake of animals 
pro as a protein and the amount of female labor needed to take care of them as well as of the gardens. So, in a way the ritual cycle of uh, uh, the Sembega is cyclical in nature. Now, for instance, uh, they plant the rumbind and then also they start rearing the pigs. Now, as and when they uproot the rumbind, they wait some kind of war and then it is followed by a certain a sacrificial or a slaughtering of the pigs once the war comes to an end. Now, in a way these sort of practices are have certain kind of overlapping meanings and uh, or, or rather uh, it every, every action is pretty much uh, interrelated. Uh, the, the manner in which they go to the war and then uh, once they started engaging in this uh, the kaiko that is the slaughtering of the pigs, they again abandon this uh, going to the waging war again. So, waging of war is not frequent at all and then the maybe it, it, it is sort of how they engage into uh, you know m more or less an exercise or a drilling as and when they are prepared and uh, when, when as and when they feel that they have enough uh, uh, pigs for consumption then they uh, go ahead with the war and then they retreat back come back and then go on with this festival sort of. Now, through all these practices uh, Rappaport uh, primarily in his work of pigs for the ancestor shows that uh, all the components of this Sembega reality is nothing but uh, it, 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 it sort of uh, tries to bring in uh, the relationship between the ecological, nutritional, social, military, ideological and, and which perhaps seems to uh, constitute a coherent uh, totality. Now, all this put together in a way is uh, uh, again the part of the Sembega ecosystem and how they are able to maintain certain kind of uh, ritual behavior and this ritual behavior is not necessarily confined to only one single perspective, but which encompasses all this put into together that is the social, political, economic so and so forth. Therefore, uh, Rappaport studies in a way uh, provide uh, a model uh, for understanding the role of uh, the ritual in, 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 uh, in creation and maintenance, not just uh, social solidarity like what uh, Durkheim has talked about, uh, but also rather in maintaining the conditions within which human organisms can survive. That is how through rituals they are able to maintain uh, a conducive uh, environment for to maintain this balance in the environment. Now, uh, we as, as we had discussed the kind of the importance of what rituals and how rituals tends to play an important role. Uh, not just only in shaping the minds, but also ritual in a sense becomes uh, an expressive and it also serves the purpose uh, to the community in terms of how they are able to maintain certain kinds of rules and regulations and they follow this. And uh, ritual cannot be seen in isolation, but also it has to be contextualized in the context of this uh, uh, ecology and the environment in general and what kind of purposes does it serve. Now, uh, uh, to have a much more deeper understanding about uh, Rappaport's or uh, ritual in general in relationship to ecology, one can refer uh, Rappaport's work. Uh, which again is reproduced in the one of his book. 
And apart from this also, we can refer uh, Rappaport's work on peaks for the ancestor. Now, uh, in the last lecture, we had uh, discussed quite at length about how uh, ritual in a way uh, becomes a sort of uh, a balancing act in terms of one's relations with or in, in, in one's adaptation with the ecology in general. And then that is purely from the uh, ecological approach to religion. Now, uh, slightly uh, moving away from what we have discussed, uh, in this course uh, or in this uh, lecture series, we would be looking at uh, how religion in a way happens to occupy or religion is considered to be sort of an alternative methods or ways uh, in, in, in resolving the environmental crisis which we are witnessing and uh, as I had uh, discussed uh, in the introduction to, uh, introductory part of the course that we would also be looking at some of the uh, contemporary theology or the religious philosophy which is uh, to be in a way situate in the context of how and to what extent religion in a way shapes our mind, our perspective, our thinkings, our imaginations and the way we perceive or look towards nature. Now, therefore, why is it that religion is supposedly considered to be uh, a, an important tool or an important perspective in this uh, present environmental crisis? Now, uh, as I had said before I'm going into details of some of the religions uh, uh, or the kind of religious philosophies which they have followed, it is pertinent to discuss uh, the background as to why religion uh, in a way is considered to be important. And in this context, it is important to see how religion in a way has shaped our understanding or uh, our conducts towards nature. Now, normally uh, if you look around, the perception towards nature might uh, be different from uh, one society to another or mostly if you look at the western and non-western society, the kind of perception uh, which they have towards the nature is also different and uh, globally the, there is a lot of divide between north and south again how the northern countries and the southern countries perceive nature or, or what, what kind of relationship they share with nature. Now, therefore, it is important to locate these human environmental relations by bringing in uh, this perspective of religion in general and how has this the present environmental crisis challenge in a way challenge and transform uh, the modern theology and the spiritual practices and, and which particular modern theology or the spiritual practices uh, caters uh, to have much more meaningful uh, understanding with nature or which religion, religious philosophy in a way uh, sort of religious teachings in a way bring human much more close to nature. The, that will of course be the kind of uh, the main gist of this uh, lectures. Now, historically if you look at maybe uh, prior to the medieval period, the medieval period and the so called modern period. Religion in all these successive generations has taught us to sort of perceive and to act on this uh, human nature in terms of a particular human interest, beliefs and social structure. Now, why is this human interest important again? Now, 
if you look at there are different forms of uh, materialism which is uh, involved even in the study of uh, uh, the from the anthropological perspective like vulgar materialism and uh, so on and so forth and and it's it's sort of uh, thinkers in a way tries to bring in uh, sort of the nuances and the differences among this materialism. The reason why I am talking about materialism is because human interest normally is being guided by the idea of accumulation and to sort of uh, squeeze or extract certain kind of profits from the natural resources. And uh, in, 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 in the process it, it some, somehow uh, tends to strain the kind of relations or uh, ideas which is being shared in general. And what are the beliefs and uh, social structure which also in a way uh, is instrumental in shaping or uh, bringing the sort of uh, the kind of perceptions which normally change. Now, uh, when we talk about the beliefs, it is normally the uh, religious teachings or the religious dogmas which are being in a way influencing an individual right from the birth. And, and in some sense, uh, these are being uh, part of the family socialization process. And this social structure in a way is pretty much uh, deep rooted and uh, embedded within that uh, it sort of uh, not just uh, train the minds of uh, the individuals in general, but also particularly the kind of uh, relations or the kind of behavior which we acted out to the non-humans uh, domain. Now, therefore, it is important to locate the human domain and the non-human domain and the kind of relationship which is being shared between them. And uh, through this, uh, for instance, uh, religious myths and law, we have in a way uh, a socialized nature framing it in terms of the human uh, uh, interest. And uh, to a great extent, uh, uh, we have done so to satisfy our needs, abilities and power relations. Now, when we talk about power relations, it is also about controlling and having the capacity to sort of dominate the nature around us. Now, the more you have uh, the controlled and dominance power, the more power you have or an authority uh, in terms of the kind of social relations which you share among other members of the society. Now, therefore, uh, within, in the, with, within this backdrop, it is important to situate how religion in a way is instrumental in shaping not just the minds, but also in terms of the kind of attitudes and perceptions which we normally have. Uh, towards the non-human actors, that is the nature around us. Now, for instance, uh, let us consider that uh, uh, many writers have uh, tends to, you know, critically look at this, uh, mostly the biblical texts about uh, men's rights to master the art, uh, which normally is uh, quite vocally talk about by Lynn White uh, by sort of blaming the Christian religion as uh, responsible for the uh, present ecological crisis which we have and uh, which I will talk in a much more detail in the later part of this lecture. And uh, men's right to master the earth is seen to be an essential source uh, for the havoc which is being witnessed. Uh, uh, by the western societies upon the earth. Now, these are some of the sort of uh, biblical critical uh, analysis which are being given. And also, uh, uh, 
Uh, why is it that the Judeo-Christian religion is being singled out or, uh, or is it because of the kind of capitalism which is being attached or rather we can say that uh, uh, the emergence of industrialism or industrialization process or capitalism in the west in a way might have perhaps led to you know uh, a critical imagination or uh, analysis of how uh, what 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 perhaps might have provoked or led to the emergence of this and then mind you uh, as i'm i'm sure you are familiar with max weber's work on uh, the Protestant ethics and the rise of capitalism and Weber a German sociologist uh, in a way tries to explore how this within the Christian religion this Protestant eth with those who pro uh, profess this Protestant ethics in a way are uh, re solely responsible for the emergence of this capitalism and what are the kind of religious teachings which in a way has uh, not just influence, but also transform the imaginations and thinkings of these people, mostly the Western Europe. Now, such kind of work in a way tends to challenge and uh, questions the religious philosophy of uh, any kind of religion for that matter. Now, also uh, perhaps the spread of uh, democracy and the critical intellectual uh, tendencies embedded in the enlightenment and the post enlightenment philosophy and also the modern science in a way uh, tends to you know uh, uh, challenge and questions on any particular religious claim to absolute truth. Now, through this you tends to you know uh, rationally or uh, challenge any kind of uh, religious teachings of philosophy and perhaps this uh, doubt in a way lead to uh, uh, some kind of a rejection of religion which is more to do with uh, which is unscientific, irrational and uh, uh, which, which cannot really withstood the modern science or the enlightenment period when people are being guided by uh, empiricism. Now, similarly uh, some of the feminist critic also uh, have a strong reservation or feeling against this religion as which is more or less identified as patriarchal biases in virtually all established traditions. Again, uh, as I was talking about the uh, Western uh, capitalist uh, mindset, which is more or less uh, being guided by this patriarchal biases, is something which the feminists have for quite some time argue and uh, raise the issue. Now, on in the in the light of this, it is important to see that how this uh, emergence of uh, the western capitalism or western science again is also being questioned uh, by so called feminists and then who do not really subscribe the essentialist idea of how things are being established. Now, therefore, uh, one needs to look into the kind of uh, ideas which are being embedded here. Now, for instance, which I categorize as uh, the eco theologians, that is, the religious teachings which are in a way uh, presumed to be close to uh, embedded with traditions and then who have much more uh, accorded relations with nature. Now, this eco theologians has in a way sought to reinterpret these old traditions that is the findings and uh, which stress more on the passages in classic texts like maybe the, the Buddhist classic texts or maybe 
Jain's books, so and so forth, which which tries to reveal uh, the kind of human uh, closeness to nature, which in a way uh, is an exercise which would uh, perhaps help us in to face this current crisis. Now, in fact, the significance of this uh, religion is uh, increasingly failed because. Uh, many of these guiding lights of modernity and uh, materialist liberal democracies has been undermined by the political violence, technological disasters and the culture bankruptcy of the late 20th century. So, the world has happens to seen a lot of violence not just among uh, human in general, but also the violence which are being met it out that is the uh, an anthropogenic influences on uh, the environment is increasingly felt and uh, what perhaps might be the reason or what could be the other way out to sort of lessen if not allow us if not uh, engage in this heightened uh, to the environment. Perhaps this have been totalitarian uh, political access this perhaps seems to also fail. This can be uh, as a source of social direct inspiration. Now, uh, uh, upcoming lectures, how the Christian religion in a way increasingly cause the environmental crisis, a retrospection or The kind of stands on pole two, the kind of responses which it also evokes and evolves in terms of how there has to be a retrospection within it. And secondly, we also be looking at some of the religions like the Hindu religion, Buddhism, Jainism, and also certain other uh, native religions which are. Uh, sort of thought to be more close to nature, the religious texts will be sort of uh, seen as our explanation, thereby trying to uh, broaden us the, the eco theologians uh, in a way has tries to unearth or uh, bring in this religious text, so that we find a way out to have an alternative methods or means in terms of looking and locating uh, the religions, which are in a way uh, can bring certain kind of a balance when we talk about the human nature relations. Thank you.